Now that we've covered the basics in the last episode, I'm gonna share more pro tips I've built up over the years. The first ones will deal with reducing brittleness. One of the main complaints people make about tests like these is that they are brittle. This means the tests often fail even though the code remains correct. These false positives create work for you and reduce you and your team's trust in the test suite with the eventual result that you run these tests less often and your code starts to degrade. Let's make this concrete with an example. Here I have a password reset spec. I'll talk briefly about how it works. We first create a user record. Then we visit the reset password URL in the browser. We fill in the user email form field with that user's email. Then we click button reset password. Next, we check the last email sent by the system, which should be the password reset email. And we extract the password link, visit that password link, enter in a new password, confirm it and update. Then eventually we log in using that new password and confirm that it works. Something I glossed over previously was this perform and queue jobs bit. Why do I do this? To understand, let's take a look at the code that's responsible for resetting the password. Here we go. User email dot reset password instructions. This basically just means what it says that there's a user email for resetting password instructions. Deliver later. Here's the important bit. This email gets sent asynchronously. It gets added to a queue and run a little bit later. Why do we do this? because we don't want to leave the user waiting after they fill in the reset password form. Sending an email can take a few seconds. Also, it can fail. We don't want the request to fail. Therefore, we return quickly and run that email in a background job. That's all well and good in production. However, within the test environment, there's an issue. If this is run asynchronously, then this will get executed milliseconds later before this has had time to run, i.e. before the email gets sent. If the email hasn't been sent yet, this is gonna be nil. Therefore, the test will fail. We avoid this by making that synchronous. Therefore, the email will have actually sent by the time we check for the last email. Let's run that test real quickly to confirm that it passes. I'm doing that from then. And you can see it's green, the test passes. So what does this test correspond to within the web app? Here you can see a bug standard reset password form. Someone enters their email here and then clicks reset my password. Nothing too special. Now, let me get to the point about brittleness. The text here has reset my password. Imagine that I wanted to change that button to reset password or that someone else in my team wants to do that. Doing that should not change whether the test fails or passes. So let me actually go to the form field and change that text. Now it says reset password. Let me run that test again. And red, it fails. If you read the error, it says unable to find button reset my password that is not disabled. What's it look like within the browser? Everything's working. All that changes is the button text. Now what I wanna do is find a way for the test to continue passing even when that text changes. The way I do that is by adding an unchanging test interface. What I like to use is HTML IDs. I never use these IDs for CSS styling and I also have a rule never to change these or at least very rarely to change these. Therefore, this is stable over a very long period of time. I'm gonna add one here. I'm gonna call it something like reset password button. Next, I'm gonna modify the test to use that instead of the text. So, Reese, oh, we can't type today. Let me run that test again. And it works, excellent. That's gonna be less brittle. And just to prove the point, let me radically change that text. Check it out in the browser. And then run the test again. And it continues to passing. This is a much better way of doing things. Far less brittle, far less likely to break over the long term. The way I see it, integration tests come in two varieties, those that require JavaScript drivers for rendering and those that do not. Tests that can render with pure HTML, HTML alone, are much, much faster. They get to interface more directly with their backend servers. By contrast, tests with JavaScript are usually far, far slower. The test you're looking at right now runs with Rack Test, a HTML only driver. Let's see what its speed is. You can see here that the whole thing ran in 1.04 seconds, let's say one second, and that the files took, let's say 0.7 seconds to load. So one minus 0.7. Now let's run that same test again with the JavaScript driver. I can do that by adding JS true as a tag here. You can see this ran in 4.43 seconds of which let's say 0.6 was load time. Let's do a bit of arithmetic here. So this is gonna to come to 0.3, and this is gonna to come to 3.7. Now let's divide the two in the Vim expression register. 
and you can see that the JavaScript test takes 12 times as long as the rec test test. Therefore, it's a good idea to use these HTML only non JavaScript tests as much as possible because your test suite will run more quickly and you'll get feedback more quickly. One of the worst things about the modern web is how everyone's JavaScript seems to be broken. Even on the sites of major companies, a button often stops working or a form often stops submitting. And when you go to look at the JavaScript console, you see something like this. Something I noticed when adding integration tests to my website is that there is a very, very quick way, a very cheap way to check for these kinds of errors. And here I have about 32 lines of code, a little module I include into my integration tests that basically causes a JavaScript integration test to fail whenever there are JavaScript errors. Roughly how this works is I define some constants with some errors I generally always want to ignore. For example, ones caused by PayPal. Yes, they have a whole section of errors. That's how bad PayPal are. And some other random errors like one from Rails, uh, one from Google Analytics. And I can't remember what this is, but it's certainly not mine. Then I have this piece of code that gets executed after every single test. If that test is a JavaScript test, what it does is it gets all the errors from the browser logs. It filters out errors to ignore based on the stuff I defined up above and also some custom stuff that might vary from test to test. Then if the errors are present, essentially it checks if the error was severe, which for example is an exception. And if it's severe, it causes the test to fail. Otherwise it prints a warning to the screen. So let's look at a test that's currently working just fine. I'm going to run this one real quick and you can see it's all green. This means that a seller is able to apply with cookie notice tracking. Now, let me add a JavaScript error. This corresponds to the new seller page, which is part of that test flow. I'm going to paste in a little bit of code here, typical behavior of an SBA in 2020. I'm going to save and now run that test again. Bear with me. Now the test fails and you can see that JavaScript error printed there. Let's go over to the browser for a sec and refresh that page. This is the page where I added the JavaScript error. I'm going to open up the JavaScript console here and you can see that error is printed. This is an example of intentionally adding brittleness to an integration test. Normally you don't want brittleness, but in this case, the brittleness is helpful. It helps me to ferret out JavaScript errors that might otherwise go unnoticed. The idea is that I don't directly integration test everything. And for the stuff I don't directly test, the presence of a JavaScript exception is probably a strong indicator that one of these things is broken. So by adding this automatic failure on JavaScript exceptions, I get a sort of smoke screen for things that could be wrong with my code. Now, something you might notice is that this will only execute in the tests that use a JavaScript driver. It won't execute in the normal ones since they don't execute JavaScript at all. However, there is a possibility of running your entire test suite from time to time with a different default driver. So instead of having rack test here, I could use my JavaScript driver Selenium Chrome and then run my entire test suite. If I do that once in a while, for example, before major releases, I'm able to ferret out all these JavaScript errors just by running my integration tests. Given that your JavaScript tests can take a rather long time to run, and also that they usually run headless without a browser you can look at, therefore it's really useful to have a way to visualize what the error is automatically after each test failure. Let me give you an example here. So here's the test where a seller of notes can apply to sell notes on my website. And if you look down here towards the end of the test, I look for the H1 title and it should have thanks for applying as its text. Basically, after someone fills in the form to apply to be a seller, I redirect them to a page that says thanks for applying. Now, in the right hand pane, you can see that particular H1. I'm going to make an error here on purpose by deleting that line, saving and then running this test again. We should expect it to fail to be read. And as expected, it is unable to find CSS H1 title. Now, one way to debug this, the kind of old school way is to laboriously fill out this form with all sorts of valid fields and then get to the next page and see what's going on.
However, I have a system in place where I automatically take a screenshot whenever there is a JavaScript test error. Let's view that particular screenshot right now. Those screenshots get saved to my temp screenshots folder. So what we want to do next is to just view that. Here we see test failure creating a seller spec. That's the name of the spec that just failed. So this seems about right. Now I'm going to run fix command and create a wrapper around this. I'm going to feed the output of that command to MCAT, which will allow me to view the image on the command line. And I'm going to run that. It'll take a second. And here you go. You can see an image of the failing page. And you'll notice here that there's a paragraph here and no H1. And this will alert me to what has gone wrong. So I can open Vim back up again by foregrounding it. And then I'll go to the thanks for applying page and see that the H1 was missing. Now I run that test again and you'll see that it will pass. So how is this done? In some development environments, I believe in Laravel Dusk, this is provided out of the box, whereas in others you have to add it yourself. So the first thing to be aware of is the window size of the browser you're using. Initially, I had this window size to be quite small and therefore it wouldn't capture all the text on my screen. This ended up being confusing. Then you have some actual code for creating those screenshots. What I do first is clear the screenshots from previous runs, otherwise they might be confusing. And elsewhere, I create that screenshot. It happens after JavaScript tests. If there's a failure, then I name that test according to the file path of that particular test. I save it in the folder you saw previously. I ensure that that folder exists. This is, for example, necessary on CircleCI. Then I save that screenshot. Note that saving screenshots is not available in all drivers. It is, however, available in the JavaScript driver. Lastly, I print that the screenshot was taken to standard out as a sort of reminder to myself or anyone else on the team. That's all I've got for now. Tune in next week for more tips on integration testing. <laughs>